on this episode of Deep Fat Fry, the disastrous making of Alien 3 and other classic films. And then we learn the true story behind the infamous Tula Bubble. Tonight, the making of Alien 3 and the truth about the Tula Bubble. Get deep. What the hell tarnation is a tulip bubble? It's a tulip that looks like a bubble. Wow. The tulip Hot bubble? Damn. I've never even heard of this shit. The tulip bubble. Hot damn, boy. This is some fresh ass, new ass shit to me. You've never heard of the tulip bubble? No. I'll be huh? I'll be learning tonight. I have, however, <laughs> heard about the disastrous <laughs> making of the film we're gonna talk about here in a second. Yeah, I figured you had, Paul. We've got we've all talked about this, and I was like, you know what? I want to just go take a deeper dive and kind of find out what happened with the making of Alien Three. David Fincher's directorial debut. It sucks too because uh, Alien and Aliens, uh, both super sweet. Uh, there's uh, here's David Fincher with a xenomorph. I think they're about to kiss. That's the impression I get. It from looks this beautiful. Picture. It looks like they love one another. And they want to yeah. hug and marry one another forever. I know. And make little Next babies. Next thing you know, people be marrying xenomorphs. You uh, let the gays marry. Where it's does a it end? Here. Uh, where does it end? Uh, like aliens, Alien Three took a long time to gestate. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Although the previous film had been a huge success, director James Cameron had moved on to other projects, and writer producer duo David Giller and Walter Hill who had been with the series from the beginning, were wary of making another installment. Probably course, rightly so. The studio being the studio, it was like, come on, guys. Like, this is a moneymaker. Let's get another one. Uh, so work eventually began on developing a story and setting, but the project was troubled from the outset, even before Fincher came on board. Got a little clip we're going to play here. So this so is a little talking about... Uh, 21, 29 here, yeah. Fincher's I just shave all their heads, put barcodes on there, you know. He's just saying David Fincher came up with this uh, concept like different for the take, film. But it would allow us to, you know, it was within the realm of, it was a spinoff of Vincent's original idea. The it's <laughs> and he's talking about one of the writers, uh, Vincent Ward. Dude, that does, dude does not sound confident in the idea. <laughs> he's just like, yeah, and, uh, you know, uh, David Fincher made us do it. And, uh, you know, it was, it was Fincher's idea. I didn't, I didn't personally... Yeah. It really wasn't my idea, but it was like, you know, a spinoff of an idea that some other guy had, you know. Yeah, it started other... out with Vincent with this with this script, and because of creative difference, the old creative difference, uh, uh, you know, problem, and then he was gone. So they had all this money that, had, that they had that already spent on, you know, making pay or play deals with actors and so on, plus building all these sets, and Norman builds the world. And I mean, he was like, I mean, yeah, great set design, but you see all the money that's already going into this and we're about to learn why, but I just want to just kind of show you guys the scope of everything. So wait, so they had this other guy, Vincent something, Vincent Ward, Vincent Ward, who was supposed to direct, right? Yeah. Like he was going to be a writer. So, yeah. He was like a filmmaker. He's a writer director. He was going to produce an alien script. Right. And they'd already, like, they were so far along in production. They'd already built like giant they, sets and well, invested. It was made at a place called Pinewood studios. Uh, okay. and they had invested at this point about $7 million. Right. Yeah. And then, then he's, he's dropped from the project or what happens? With Aliens him? also shot at Pinewood in the UK, by the way. Gotcha. Oh, makes sense. See, there, there's some, uh, alien knowledge for you guys. Okay. So we're gonna get more into it. Uh, so this guy is Rennie Harlan, uh, the Finnish director of a nightmare on Elm street four and die hard two was initially brought on with the intention of making a movie in which Ripley traveled to the alien homeworld, which sounds fucking awesome. Uh, they dismissed it, of course, as too expensive, and Harlan eventually left the project. So he made his pitch, and they're right. like, too much money. All, All right. right, well, but look, I mean, that does sound like a cool movie, but Nightmare on Elm Street 4 is not the best of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, no. and Die Hard 2 is definitely not the best of the Die Hard movies. Agreed. So I don't know. Maybe it was best that they dodged the bullet of this guy. Well, they did. This is actually Vincent Ward. So in 1990, Ward wrote the story for Alien 3. Of course, a proposed sequel for the Alien films. Uh, he was actually the fourth of 10 different writers to tackle the Alien 3 project. 
So that that's said in 10 different writers. Right. So there is no actual vision for this thing, basically. This is a Frankenstein. Uh, much of the plot and several of the characters from Ward's script will later fuse with the prison setting from David Toey's proposed uh, script to form the basis of Alien 3 as it was ultimately made. Ward received a story by credit for, on the final film. The heart of his story, known as Monks in Space version, was however not captured in the film. So this dude was like more envisioning. Well, well I'm about to tell you actually okay. what his thing is. So the development process, which much further until writer Vincent Ward proposed a movie about a monk like society on a planet sized wooden ship floating in space. Okay. So that was kind of his idea. Uh, Ward wrote a series of scripts, hired illustrators to design his wooden world and eventually began building some of the sets, which is what we just talked about here. Uh, but creative tensions mounted with the film's producers and Ward who could never quite offer an explanation for his space-bound wooden world. He exited the project, and then, of course, David Fincher came on board. Okay, so the big wooden ship. I'm, like, not, I'm not saying that that is like a bad idea in any sort of setting, but I think in the context of the alien universe that had been established by the previous two films, it does seem a little bit like cartoonish. I think that that's like the big problem is that after um, after you lost like Ridley Scott and James Cameron, you know, it, like the series just did devolve into cartoony bullshit. And I think if you'd done this version with a bunch of monks living well, in a wooden look, ship, I mean, let's that would have probably just like that probably would have just accelerated the cartoonish decline of let's, these fucking films. Let's be honest about it. The monks in space aspect, I, I think whoever wrote that part of the article that you pulled that from is being dishonest. It does show up in alien three, like the fucking colonists at fury, whatever it was, fury six, two, one or whatever the fuck many of them have joined a religion led by that black guy where they have sworn off lust and like monks. Right. And uh, the, the appearance of Ripley throws that whole monastic order into disarray because well, now all of the sudden they're, saying they're monks faced in with space. the well, well, they're on the planet. Well, the, 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 I would say sure. thematically that that was taken, but he had a vision of like a ship. It was like sure. a planet ship. In and space. it sounds like a, cool. A wooden on ship full of outright like monks. A, this is, we're talking about like a prison planet that maybe has some like elements of well, that monastic order. Does a order wooden ship in space trip. sound cool? Like what is a wooden ship in space? Like how do you do I, that? You know, yeah, I, mean? I don't know. Well, I, I think that was kind of what it, they it what, sounds ultimately like, where this went with the project, though. With it I mean, sounds like people understand. asking that question is what eventually drove him to leave this project. Yeah, like, yeah so which like, is why? ridiculous because like they kept it. Like once again, his his fingerprint is on this movie. I disagree. Like the yes. monastic, the monks. No, it is not in space. Like, but but like extra planetary future monk thing definitely got lifted. Right. Well, he did a. Uh, I mean, he did get a story well, credit. He got a story by credit. Uh, David Toey, actually the guy who did um, the Riddick movies, uh, he was credited as one of the writers. And then Fincher kind of just came in with the studio and just like created this monster of a movie is essentially what happened. Like, like I think if David Fincher had been hired directly to do this movie with a script, it probably would have been a pretty decent aliens. Another thing that I've found uh, in my research was that uh, James Cameron and Ridley were both kind of offered the director's chair for this film. Yes, that is true. Both I declined. Um, uh, Ridley well, Scott was, Rid was too busy. Yeah. Well, no. Well, Jim, Jim Cameron was too busy. Ridley's vision for the franchise was later to be expressed in Prometheus and Covenant. And yeah. it was the, those those the the those nascent ideas were deemed by the studio to be too expensive at the time um, for what they had envisioned the budget of this I'm, film to be. I'm not at all surprised. Yeah, because I mean they totally balked <sighs> on the alien world thing, which is yeah. kind of what you know really was definitely hinting at with Prometheus. Like we thought, like okay, we're actually going to get that version where they go like, where's is is there a xenomorph home world? But of course, you know, when it's kind of a different direction. Went the David direction, uh, the Peter O'Toole ripoff. Wait a minute. You're not Walter. You're, You're David. David. Dun, dun, dun. It's like, okay. Oh. I've known for a You're fucking gonna... long time that Alien 3 was beleaguered by this kind of jockeying and Hollywood bullshit, right? That was actually yeah. a news story at the time, kind of making excuses for why this movie wasn't doing as well as its predecessor and blah, 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 blah. 
So that I got that scuttlebutt when this movie was new. Every right. it was very loud that this movie was beleaguered by these types of problems that Scotty's going to cover here tonight. Um, but I think that despite those challenges, the movie manages to be a competent alien film because if for no, no other reason, number one, the fucking uh, visual design harkens back to Ridley Scott's original, which you can't fucking argue. It, it's a little bit of a knockoff Ridley Scott, but that real tight, cramped, old, dusty kind of tramp freighter in space thing that they had going on was is brought back in this film, which is good. It's a departure from the bigger, more bombastic action film and kind of a return back to the smaller more desperate story of the first film. Sure. They're they're basically basically in a prison. Yeah. Right. And it throws Ellen Ripley, who at this point in my mind is a feminist icon after alien and especially aliens into a really uncomfortable situation. Sexually. She's in a situation where she could be easily overpowered by the people that are in this prison and whatever done to her. Right. And so she, she, isn't in that position of command anymore that she's usually used to in situations that go awry. So she has to earn the trust of these men. Right. And you know, you know Paul, there's actually someone very famous that agrees with you, but he has another take. I don't think you'd agree with, you know, okay. who Charles Dance is Tywin uh, Lannister. They they're actually the love interest in aliens three yes. or alien three. Yes. Uh, he actually said, he basically agrees with your assessment, but also shits on aliens. So I don't think you'd agree with that. He's like, he thought aliens was too over the top. And this was kind of a more of a return to form. He's like, sure. so actually he's a, he's actually an ardent defender of the movie, but I don't think you'd agree with his aliens take. I, I don't, on the face of it, but it's interesting <laughs> yeah. to know that I'm not alone out there. No, so actually, yeah, someone that was in it. I mean, like, and that's, and I'll tell you what, that is saying something about it. And he actually had glowing things to say about <laughs> David Fincher too. He's like, he kind of was like, well, this guy is like, you basically told like this is a first time director like okay this guy's gonna be you know whatever but it's like david fincher was super prepared like he took this so seriously yeah, i think this story here kind of exemplifies that yep i'll never forget uh, uh david's complete devotion to the color of blood producer uh urza swordlow says in wreckage and rage which is one of the documentaries we're actually just taking a look at set footage shows fincher um, musing about shooting a thousand takes on an exploding head insisting to an obviously skeptical swordlow that they could only shoot under certain sky and weather conditions. Swordlow describes Fincher as openly contemptuous of studio oversight and says the studio responded by trying to, quote, break him. I must break you. I must break you, Fincher. (laughs) Uh, The conflicts between Fincher and the studio were exacerbated by a rush schedule, of course. Well, that always helps productions. Ward's wooden monastery planet idea was scrapped in favor of a prison planet concept, but the script wasn't complete. Oops. Well, that's kind of difficult. Meanwhile, construction of the film's huge sets had already begun. We, we saw that a minute ago. So a lot of the sets for Aliens, uh, or Alien 3, excuse me, I keep fucking butchering the name, uh, actually had to be repurposed. Like, because they, they spent $7 million building sets for this wooden chip planet thing, and it's like, oh, wait, we can't use that. But David Fincher was very uh, capable, so he was actually able to repurpose a lot of these sets and make it work, surprisingly. Uh, let's see the next one. And and the movie's uh, updated alien design hadn't been finalized. So, of course, they didn't have a final alien design, which meant the creature builders were trying to catch up, too. And if actually you keep watching that, they Dude, talk about that. They in, the, in the summer, they kind of pause production. And they're working on, like, why did these producers get balls deep on this alien picture before they even had basic shit fucking Because their studio, down. they want it out. They don't care they're what like, they oh, got. Oh, man, we got to get some fucking alien movie out there. Build a set. Build a set. Oh, we don't like the concept. Oh, shit. <laughs> get a new guy. How about Jaws? Jaws. You guys ever heard about the making of Jaws? I have heard some of the stuff about... I heard the mechanical shark worked very rarely. And that's actually... It was actually supposed to be in more of the movie, but it was so hard to work with. They could only kind of really bring it out for the stuff that they absolutely had to. I was terrified of this movie as a kid. The scene in Jaws, the opening scene where the lady's just swimming in the ocean, like it's, it's portrayed here, basically. Like the movie opens with a woman swimming in the ocean and then, you know, she notices something going on around her and you see how alone and how far out she is. And then all of a sudden she's grabbed by something and they built some kind of rig to pull her around under the water and she thrashes around and blood comes bubbling out. 
and you know tagline or fucking movie t- title card you know what i mean it's just like that scene scared the fuck out of me as a kid i remember being deathly afraid of watching that movie uh, oh, because, yeah. just because of that opening scene when i was a kid and uh, like and then once i got over it and watched the actual movie nothing in the movie is actually anywhere near as scary as that opening scene you know what i mean it's kind of sad well that's the thing that kind of like but it hooks you they hammer you with that i mean like it starts off more like oh my god this creature but it goes way more into being like a a fucking character study with these yeah. like dudes out at the sea and stuff, which is a, it's a great movie, but it is a great movie. I didn't mean to disparage the film, but I'm just saying but yeah, that, as, like, as, as a horror movie, I don't think it ever, I don't think it ever fucking offers a scare like it does in that, in that opening scene. You're totally right. I mean, I think seeing that with, you know, with the advent of CGI and seeing they, they could basically make whatever monster, whatever person, I think we see why that Spielberg ultimately went in that direction probably sure, more sure. so than just the, you know, over the top, let the shark kill you, but it's still definitely cool. Ah, yes, tulips. Um, so you see here, this is tulip price index from 1636 to 1637. So it's about the Dutch tulip bubble. So its peak was in 1637. And this is a, we're actually going to find out a little bit more about this, because I've heard about this for years, this extraordinary tulip bubble that is like kind of like an example of like, look, anything can be a bubble. Anything, any, any commodity or anything that has any value in a capitalistic system. Well, in a capitalistic system, this can occur. So according to Charles McKay's famous book, Extraordinarily Impop- Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, the following amount was paid for a single tulip root. Two lasts of wheat. Four lasts of rye. Four fat oxen. Eight fat swine. Twelve fat sheep. Two hogheads of wine. Four tons of beer. Two tons of butter, 1,000 pounds of cheese, a complete bed, a suit of clothes, and a silver drinking cup. You're talking about for a fucking tulip root? For the root of a tulip, Paul. (laughs) You gotta be kidding me, bro. (laughs) I am not kidding you, sir. By 1636, any tulip, even bulbs recently considered garbage, could be sold off often for hundreds of guilders, which is, I guess, their fake money. A futures market existed for bulbs, and tulip traders could be found conducting their business in hundreds of Dutch taverns. Tulip mania reached its peak during the winter of 1636 to 1637, when some bulbs were changing hands ten times a day. The zenith came early that winter at an auction to benefit seven orphans whose only asset was 70 fine tulip bulbs left by their father. One, a rare Bulotin Admiral Van Ikenhusen bulb, that's a fucking mouthful of the name for a bulb, was about to be split in two and sold for 5,200 guilders, or guilders, excuse me. The all-time record. All told, the flowers brought in nearly 53,000 guilders. Damn, that's a lot of fucking guilders, bro. Yeah, these, I don't know what a guilder, what that's in real money, but it sounds like a lot of fucking money. It's probably be hard to even figure out an exchange rate after all this but time. But if guys, what goes up must come down. Soon Uh-oh. after, the tulip market crashed utterly and spectacular. Oh, no. It began in Harlem at a routine bulb auction when, for the first time, the greater fool refused to show up and pay. So they're like, ah, this tulip now goes for this exor- exorbitant price. Within days, the panic spread across the country. Despite the efforts of traders to prop up demand, the market for tulips evaporated. Flowers that had commanded 5,000 guilders a few weeks before now fetched one one hundredth that amount. So Uh-oh. wait a minute. They basically like pumped this thing so high that they set a price for a tulip that one of these fucking giant whales was like, you know what? A herd of oxen, 28,000 barrels of cheese, 29 billion guilders, my wife's pussy for a week, my firstborn son, and uh, everything that I earn seems a bit steep. I think I shall pass on purchasing this orchid. And then everybody was like, nobody cares about the fucking tulip no more. Deep fat fly.
fight. Deep bad fight. 